Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we will be examining a variety of theories that attempt to explain why countries are at different stages of development. The study of economic development really emerged after World War II, as countries gained independence and the gap between more developed countries that had industrialized earlier and less developed countries that hadn't was wider than ever. So several theories emerged to attempt to explain this divide. We'll start with Walter Rostow's model of modernization. Rostow's theory of development suggests that countries go through a common linear pattern of structural change, explains the development experience of Western countries, and is a general model for many others. This model looks at economic development as a spectrum from traditional to modern that every country will eventually move through. Rostow developed his theory in 1960 as colonialism was ending and many countries gained independence. He based his theory on the development experience of the United States and Western Europe and believed that the newly independent countries in Africa and Asia would experience the same linear steps. As countries move through Rostow stages, their economy becomes increasingly diverse as it industrializes. The traditional society is the first stage of Rostow's model. It's primarily rural with subsistence agriculture and other primary sector activities dominating the economy. The U.S. was in this stage in the 1700s, and Afghanistan would be used as a contemporary example. In the second stage, called preconditions to take off, industrialization is accelerating due to investment by private individuals, but it's still early. The secondary sector expands, but narrowly. The U.S. was in this stage during the first half of the 1800s, and Nigeria would be listed as stage two preconditions to take off now. By stage three, known as the takeoff stage, rapid rural to urban migration occurs as manufacturing quickly expands and the secondary sector becomes dominant. The U.S. experienced this during the second half of the 1800s, and Brazil is experiencing it now. After takeoff, a country enters the drive to maturity. There is significant growth in the tertiary sector as countries see improvements in education and income. The U.S. was in the drive to maturity during the early years of the 20th century, while China is currently in the drive to maturity. The age of mass consumption, also known as high mass consumption, marks the fifth and final stage of Rostow's model. It is characterized by a highly urban, tertiary dominant economy. Most people can accumulate wealth to such a degree that they don't need to worry about subsistence needs. The US has been in this stage since post-World War II period of the 1950s, and Japan would be another country to use as an example. So basically, this theory states that countries will move in a linear progression from lower levels of development to higher levels of development. Rostow argued that free market capitalism and investment are what will drive economic development because it had driven economic development in many countries of Western Europe as well as Canada and the United States. But there are limitations and criticisms of this theory as well. One major issue with Rostow's model is that it argued that countries proceed along this development path in isolation from one another. But in our increasingly globalized world, countries are highly interconnected and interdependent on one another. In addition, it doesn't address that many countries that are less developed are that way because they were colonized and intentionally underdeveloped by many of the same countries that Rostow bases his model on. 
So periphery countries have significant barriers to development that early starters did not have. Finally, with the end goal being high mass consumption, the issues of overconsumption of resources and sustainability are certainly problems. In response to Rostow's theory, Emmanuel Wallerstein created the World Systems Theory in 1974. The World Systems Theory is Wallerstein's theory, describing the spatial and functional relationships between countries in the world economy. It categorizes countries as part of a hierarchy consisting of the core, the periphery, and the semi-periphery. He responded to many parts of Rostow's modernization model that he disagreed with. Wallerstein argued that countries do not develop in isolation, but rather that they are dependent on one another. Unlike Rostow, who suggested that every country could reach the highest level of development, Wallerstein argued that there will always be a combination of countries with sharp social and economic gaps in development. And Wallerstein believed that the capitalist world economy was the cause of uneven economic development. In stark contrast to Rostow, who believed that capitalism was the reason that countries would continue to improve. The most developed countries are the core. The core countries industrialized first and have the most advanced technologies and the highest levels of consumption. They have a strong military, a highly skilled and educated workforce primarily focused on the tertiary sector, and a diversified economy. They have dominated periphery countries because the core were the first to industrialize. Core countries were the colonizers and still exert control through neocolonialism. And this can be applied at different scales. For example, the core region of the United States would be the urban, high income, and politically significant stretch from Boston to Washington, DC. On the other hand, the periphery are the least developed countries. These economies are based in the primary sector with little economic diversity and low consumption levels. The workforce is less skilled and the countries are politically weak due in part to their history as colonies. According to Wallerstein, the periphery is exploited by the core. So raw materials flow out of the country in exchange for capital or money. But since finished products are sold back at a significant markup, often keeping those living in poverty from being able to improve their situation. And then there is the semi-periphery. These countries are in the middle, exhibiting characteristics of both the core and periphery. These countries exert more power than peripheral regions, but remain heavily influenced by core regions. They have some economic diversification and are often home to many workers in the secondary sector, such as factory workers, but also in the tertiary sector for low skill services, such as call center workers. So let's look at the map. What do you notice? What do you see? Are there any surprises? Any patterns or trends that you notice. Go ahead and write down what you see, what you think, what you observe. So if Wallerstein argued that there will always be dominant countries that will exploit less dominant countries. Is there any mobility between groups? Sure, but it's difficult. Take some of the countries of the semi-periphery. These countries are likely to have been peripheral regions that are on the rise, like Mexico and India, but they could also have been core countries that are in decline, like Russia. As countries shift from periphery to semi-periphery, there is a decline in primary sector employment and an increase in secondary sector employment. But again, this model can work at different scales. 
Mexico is a semi-periphery country that is industrializing, but nearly 40% of its population lives in poverty. But most of those in poverty are in peripheral parts of Mexico, primarily the southern part of Mexico. In Mexico City, the capital, as well as in Mexico's northern states, the poverty rates are much lower and the quality of life is considerably higher. But just like Rostow, there are limitations to Wallerstein's model as well. Some have argued that it focuses too heavily on the economic aspects of development. In addition, the fact that Wallerstein argued that there's little mobility for periphery countries has been criticized, as well as the fact that there, there isn't an explanation for how countries can seek to improve. Finally, there are several countries that clearly do not fit into the model. India is an example of a country that sought to avoid economic dependence. They developed a variety of industries within the country and now have a diversified and globally involved economy. The world systems theory built on an earlier theory known as dependency theory. Basically, dependency theory is the theory that the periphery is poor because it was economically dependent on the core in a disadvantageous relationship originally established under colonialism and imperialism. So it states that peripheral countries offer cheap labor and raw materials to the global market. Core countries buy the raw materials and hire the cheap labor. The core utilizes these cheap materials and labor to produce finished goods thereby adding value and selling them for higher prices. Peripheral countries will buy these products, essentially transferring funds that might otherwise improve their country, creating a situation of perpetual underdevelopment. So you can really see the influence of this model on Wallerstein's world systems theory. Both world systems theory and the broader dependency theory aim to explain global inequality between the core and periphery. But again, there are criticisms of dependency theory. Some experts argue that the definition of dependent is not clearly distinguished from the highly interdependent global economy that we currently experience. Others argue that this theory overemphasizes economics, another criticism of Wallerstein, while paying too little attention to the social and cultural variations between countries. Still, other critics point out that the causes of underdevelopment in Latin America are different than the causes in Asia and Africa and cannot be succinctly summarized in a single theory. Our final examination is a specific aspect of dependency theory known as commodity dependence. Commodities are raw materials that are processed into finished goods, things like oil and timber, coffee or cotton. So commodity dependence is an aspect of dependency theory that occurs when more than 60% of a country's exports and economic growth are tied to one or two resources. When a country is overly dependent on commodity exports for income, they're considered commodity dependent. The UN issues a report that examines commodity dependence. Most recently, it looked at 189 countries and determined that 102 of them were commodity dependent. Almost all of the commodity dependent countries were LDCs, including 89% of Sub-Saharan African countries and 50% of Latin American countries. Because their economy is based on raw materials, it is heavily influenced by global supply and demand. When demand is high, they can make a lot of money, as Venezuela and Saudi Arabia did when oil peaked in 2014 at $115 per barrel. But then demand decreased and prices fell below $50 per barrel. Venezuela's economy collapsed 
and Saudi Arabia had to dig into its deep financial reserves. Essentially, commodity-dependent economies balance their whole economic system on just one or two pillars. More developed countries tend to have a more diversified economy, with income coming from multiple economic sectors. And these countries can weather economic downturns in a single commodity. But this can also lead to conflict over who controls that commodity within the country. For example, Sierra Leone depends on diamond revenue, but mercenaries and criminals run rampant and create instability within the country. In short, some countries have benefited from commodity dependence, primarily those in the Middle East who are dependent on oil. But decades of evidence indicate that commodity dependence is linked to underdevelopment because prices on the global market are unstable and thus revenue is unpredictable. But we'll examine more specific examples when we return to class. Have a good evening, everyone.